Everyone, welcome back to our online video lecture. For today's discussion, we would be tackling a new chapter, and that is Chapter 8, Photography. Now, before we begin with our formal lecture, let us discuss the basic objectives for this chapter. Now, by the end of this discussion, we are hoping to, number one, to be able to define photography and its derivation. Our second objective, to be able to understand the importances of photography. Our third objective, to understand the history of photography. The fourth objective, for us to be able to familiarize the most basic rule when it comes to photography, and that is the rule of thirds. And our last objective, to be able to understand the different types of photography. Now, let us start this discussion by defining first the term photography. Now, what is the etymology of the word photography? It is derived from two Greek words, photos or phos, which means light, and graphe, which means line or drawing. So, if we base the etymology of the word photography, the simplest definition for it is drawing with light. Now, why is photography considered drawing with light because light or any other form of radiant energy such as ultraviolet rays are used to be able to create durable images and record it onto a light sensitive surface now who was the first person who coined the word photography it was the man as you can see on the right side of your powerpoint presentation sir john Herschel in a lecture before the Royal Society of London. Now, if we go back to the basic definition of photography, it is defined as the process of recording image onto a light-sensitive surface. Now, what is an example of a light-sensitive surface? That is your photographic Film. If you are what we consider as batang 90s, you have probably seen a manual camera wherein to be able to record an image instead of using SD cards, we need to have a lot of rolls of camera to be able to record also a lot of images. Now, if you would look at the photographic film, it is only a thin sheet of film, but underneath the thinness, lies different layers. Now, two of the most important layers of a photographic film are the emulsion and the base of your photographic film. Now, your photographic film contains light-sensitive substances. Hence, it, that is uh, the reason why it can record an image. Now, these light-sensitive substances are what we call silver salts. And technically, the silver salts are called silver halides. Now, going back to the two of the most important parts of a photographic film. Now, the first one is your emulsion layer. Now, where is the emulsion layer located? Now, if we look at the picture on the right side, the red layer, that is the emulsion layer of your photographic film. It is the light-sensitive portion of a film or paper that records the image. Your emulsion layer contains the silver halides and any sensitizing dyes. So once you click the shutter button of your manual camera, light comes out from it, the image is automatically recorded onto the emulsion layer. Now, as you can see, the emulsion contains not only silver halides. Silver halides can only detect two kinds of colors, blue and violet. Now, what if the image contains other colors aside from blue and violet? That is where your sensitizing dyes come into the picture. So, the purpose of your sensitizing dyes is to be able to record also other kinds of colors aside from blue and violet. Violet. Now, the second important layer is your base. Now, if we look at, again at the picture on the right, where are the bases located? First, okay, if you look at the center, we have the word film 
base. So that is the first uh, base that can be found in your photographic film. At the top portion, you can see the gelatin antihilation layer. That is the second base. And the third base is located at the bottom, the gelatin protective coating. So those are the three bases that you can find on your photographic film. Now, what is the purpose of your base? Your base is what holds the silver halides together to make sure that the colors are evenly dispersed. So your base would serve as a support for the emulsion layer. Now, what are the importances of photography? Why do we need photography in our lives? The very first importance of photography, our photographs tells us of what we consider as important to us. Now, if you ask me what are the very first possessions that I would rescue from my burning house, my answer would be, aside from the title of our house and lot, our passports and other important documents, it is a photo album or even a hard drive containing our family's digital images. Now, it's interesting. Why would I answer a photograph album rather than a valuable jewelry or appliances? Now, my impulse to save our recorded memories is actually a powerful force which tells us much about the role of photography in our lives, okay? You may call me sentimental, but that is the truth. I would really save our photo albums. And that is a constant desire to be able to distill our most precious moments into images. We want to preserve important events and people in our lives, we want to remember them always, to not forget them. That is a, a very powerful force that photography can give. Ceremonies such as birth and birthdays, marriages and anniversaries, holidays and new houses. They are all recorded because they matter to us. They matter to you. Photographs are our personal story. It is a timeline of our lives filled with faces and places that we love so dearly. They are our story which we can also share with other people. That is why we have that so-called virtual photo album in Facebook where we can collect hundreds of images, pictures that we can share with other people. And these hundreds of images come together to form a narrative of our lives. My mother, and I think your mothers also, have this photo albums of you starting from the day that you were born up until your kindergarten graduation, your grade school graduation, or even up until your high school graduation. Your mothers love to collect those different pictures of stages in your lives because your mothers consider you as a very important part of their lives. As they say, photographs are what you call a compact time machine. Do you agree? I firmly agree. It is a compact time machine because once you uh, look at a particular photograph, you are able to be transported back on that particular moment. So for your mothers, for example, if they see a picture of you on the day you were born, they are being transported and it gives them that nostalgic feeling, that nostalgia of being able to feel the day that you were born. So these hundreds of images come together and it forms a narrative of our lives. Now, the second importance of photography, photographs allow us to share and to communicate. Images are much more than a simple record. Photography speaks to the best and the most generous part of our human nature, and that is the desire to share what we find beautiful and interesting with others. You only have to look at Flickr, Instagram, Pinterest, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, 
and a multitude of photo sharing sites to see this impulse at work. Millions of people sharing their personal, passionate, and sometimes quirky take on the world around them. You may see a lot of people posting a random rock or a leaf, for example, and sometimes the photograph is, or the caption of the photograph is unrelated to the photo that was posted, but who cares? That person finds that leaf as sentimental or important to him, so he wants to share it with you. Our images can involve a world of strangers in our life, and that is the beauty of the internet. We are able to develop our social connectivity, our social connections. We may even find friends using this photo sharing site. And how powerful is that? Now, this is the perfect example to showcase how powerful photography is, specifically the power to share a photograph. It can actually change a life of a person. Now, in June 2015, Joyce Torrefranca from Mandawi City posted this photograph of a homeless boy named Daniel Cabrera do, while he was doing his homework on a street corner using the light coming from uh, the fast food chain. Now, this simple photograph garnered a lot of shares and likes and eventually it became viral. A simple photograph shared by a netizen changed the future of this child and his family because of how hardworking Daniel is when it comes to his homework. He was given a scholarship by a congressman. Her mother and sibling who was working on a nearby restaurant was given financial assistance by the local government to be able to start their own business and to be able to sustain the education of uh, Daniel and his siblings. Now you see, a simple photograph shared by Joyce changed the life of this kid. That is one perfect example to showcase how powerful photography is. And we have the last importance of photography. Photography gives us the freedom to become artists in our own right. Now, photography allows us to express ourselves through an art form. We notice a beautiful landscape or an old man's lined face and we want to capture it. Each of us will have a different reason to do so. But essentially, just like what any other artist would say, you capture it because you want to create something from it. Now, not all of us are able to enroll ourselves in a formal photography school. But as long as you have the patience to learn, you have uh, the certain skill set to be able to learn the basics of photography. If you have a good camera or even a camera phone and you have a stable internet, you are able to share your works with other people. It doesn't matter if you are formally trained. All of us, as long as we want to create something from it, we can all become artists in our own right. Let us continue with discussing the history of photography. Now, the predecessor of our modern-day camera is the camera obscura. Camera obscura is a Latin word which means dark room in English. It is a box with a pinhole at the front and a glass screen or mirror at the opposite and what the artist would do is that he or she would reproduce or trace the image that is being reflected on the glass screen or in the mirror. In a way, Camera Obscura is not only the predecessor of our modern-day camera, it is also the predecessor of the modern-day photocopying machine. Now, why is Camera Obscura called dark room and not dark box, as you can see on the picture on the left side. Now, camera obscura is called dark room because the larger the subject, the larger the camera obscura. So, for example, if you want to capture this large estate, basically your camera obscura would also be as large as one 
room. That is why it is called dark room and not dark box. Now fast forward to the 1820s and we have lithography. Joseph Nipsey, as you can see on the right side of your PowerPoint presentation, is a French scientist who improved the art of lithography. It is a method of printing which is based initially on the immiscibility of oil and water. Now, he discovered a way to copy engravings onto a lithographic limestone. So what is an example of a lithographic limestone? As you can see on the left side, that is your example of a lithographic limestone using a variety of materials, mainly bitumen, a light reacting asphalt. Now, when light shined through the paper, it will burn an image into the dark bitumen, which created an almost identical image or a reproduction from the original. Now, here is an example of the lithographic process. Welcome to an overview of lithography, a process created in 1796 by Alois Senefelder, who worked out that grease can be etched into a stone and printed when the stone is damp. Artists that have used this process include the French Impressionist Toulouse-Lautrec, the caricature artist Dormier, and the fine artist Henry Moore. Now, first things first, we just have to get the stone prepared, ready to be drawn on. So the first thing we have to do is prepare your stone. Here we have limestone quarried from Bavaria and a levigating tool which we'll use with carborundum to get your stone completely level and ready for your drawing. So we're starting off with coarse carborundum grits. We apply this to the entire stone and then using the levigator follow a figure of eight pattern. So we're removing a thin layer off the top of the limestone using the carborundum grit. And then when it gets a little bit too stiff, what we do is we remove the levigator safely and wash off all of this excess limestone. And now using the fan or a hairdryer to get this off, I like to be traditional. So to check level of the stone, we tug on a piece of newsprint under a true edge ruler. And the areas where it moves indicates a low point and the high areas need to be ground down further. So now we've prepared the stone, we're now ready to draw your image onto the stone directly. So we have, I have a series of crayons here which I'm using, also known as chalk, which I apply directly onto the stone. Starting off with light tones and then going darker. So at this stage, it's all about what you want to draw and drawing it directly onto the stone, as you would with normal paper. Now this is a greasy ink used in lithography to create delicate washes or strong bold areas of colour. So now your drawing is complete, we're going to take it over back to the sink and apply resin and French chalk onto your drawing. So now we've applied the French chalk, we're ready for the first etch. So the etch is compromised of gum arabic mixed with nitric acid and this gets placed over your drawn image, like so, and then gets brushed in. Once you've done it for about two minutes, we then remove the excess etch. So now we're gonna wash out your drawn image with solvent, and you can start seeing now a ghost of your image on the stone. And now we're ready to use asphaltum, which is a greasy substance, petroleum-based substance, which acts as a base for your ink to go onto, so it'd be more attractive to greasy ink. So now we're ready to take the stone onto the printing press. And this is a direct printing press. And the main thing, which is really important, is to keep the stone damp. So now we're rolling up with black ink used for lithography. This just has to be oil-based ink for lithography to work. And now we start rolling up. So we first go onto newsprint with a few sheets of extra newsprint as packing, and then this is followed up 
by a bit of mylar material, which is like a plastic, thin plastic. And now we need a grease space lubricant to run it through the press. So now we're going to reveal the print. So now I'll put this on the drying rack and get the stone ready for a new print. So here's the original lithograph we've been working towards in this introduction to lithography. We've been working in black and white, but whatever colour you choose to ink up on the stone will come out in your final print. Now fast forward again to 1988. This is where the first real digital camera was created. Now the first real digital camera that recorded images as a computerized file was produced with a Fuji DSIP. Now as you can see on the background, that is your example of the camera that was produced by the Fuji DSIP. Now your memory card is actually as big as the camera and the memory size is only two megabytes. It is also during this year that the first JPEG or Joint Photographic Experts Group for the Photos and MPEG or Moving Pictures Experts Group Standards were fixed. And in 1990, DICAM model became the first commercially available digital Camera. Now, as you can see on the background, that is your example of the DICAM model. Your DICAM model can actually be likened to the remote control of an air conditioner, and it is also compact. That is why it easily became a hit to the public because you can easily put it in your pocket and you can carry it everywhere you go. Now, if you would look at the picture on the background, your lens is located in the center. At the bottom of the lens, you have your shutter on the left side, you have your flash, and on the right side, you have your viewfinder. So let us continue with the most basic photography rule, and that is the rule of thirds. Now, what is the basic principle behind the rule of thirds? Now, you always see these grid lines on the camera application of your smartphone. But whenever you take or you want to take a picture, you sometimes, not sometimes, always, I think, you always remove the grid lines because you think of it as an nuisance when it comes to your view. But that is the basic principle behind the rule of thirds. Now, the rule of thirds is to imagine breaking down an image into thirds both horizontally and vertically as you can see on the picture so that you have nine equal parts the theory is that if you place points of interest in the intersections or along the lines your photo becomes more balanced and it will enable a viewer of the image to interact with it more naturally. Now, we are accustomed to thinking that if we put our subject in the center, then our photograph becomes balanced or balanced looking. But if we base the rule of thirds, it is wrong. The photograph is not balanced if you put it in the center. The photograph is balanced if you place your points of interest or your subject in the intersections. The four points of intersection or along the vertical and horizontal lines. Okay, so let us start with the vertical line. So what is the purpose of your vertical lines? Let's use this picture on the upper right corner as an example. Now your vertical lines are useful if you want to take whole body shots of your subjects. So you have a subject, a human subject in this picture as an example. Now as you can see, the photographer uh, placed uh, the subject along the right vertical line. Therefore, 
keeping the photograph balanced looking. So that is the purpose of your, uh, your vertical lines. So second, what is the purpose of your horizontal lines? Your horizontal lines are useful if you want to take landscape photographs. Now, please look at the bottom left photograph. Now, as you can see, the subject of the photograph is or are the mountain ranges, as you can see on the background. Now, it is balanced because the mountain ranges are located on the upper horizontal line of the grid lines, right? And the last one, you have your four intersecting points. Now, your four intersecting points are useful if you want to take close-up shots or what you call head shots of your photographs. Or for models, this is what they call profile shots. Now, as you can see on the bottom right photograph, that is your example of how we can employ the four intersecting points. Now, whenever you take uh, headshots or uh, profile shots of your subjects, make sure that either the left eye or the right eye is located or pointed along the four intersecting points. But now, before we, I continue, let me explain a headshot. So your headshot starts from the shoulders up until the head area of your subject. Now going back to the picture, as you can see, the left eye of your subject is actually located on the upper left intersecting point. That is why if you look at the photograph minus the grid lines, if you imagine uh, removing the grid lines, the photograph is balanced looking. Now let's have a simple activity before we continue. Please look at the following pictures onto the next slides and tell me if they follow the rule of thirds or not. So again, remember, imagine first dividing the photograph into nine equal parts. Now here is your first picture. Please tell me if it follows the rule of thirds or not. Okay, this picture does not follow the rule of thirds. Now, again, divide the image into nine equal parts. Your subject, which is the tree, is located at the center space of your grid lines. Therefore, not balanced looking, it does not follow the rule of thirds. Okay, on to your second picture. Does it follow the rule of thirds? Okay, when you divide the image into nine equal parts, it does follow the rule of thirds, okay? The ladybug, which is the subject of the image, is located along the right vertical line of your grid lines. It is balanced looking and it follows the rule of thirds. Okay, on to your third picture. Please tell me if this image follows the rule of thirds or not. Okay, this image follows the rule of thirds. Okay, if you divide the image into nine equal parts, the windmills, which are the subjects of this image, are located both on the left and right vertical lines of your grid lines. Now here is your fourth picture. Please tell me if the image follows the rule of thirds or not. Okay, this image follows the rule of thirds. Now, if you divide the image into nine equal parts, because it is a, a headshot, so we have to take note of the four intersecting points. So the left eye of your subject, or the right eye, depending on how you view it, 
is actually located on the upper left intersecting point. Therefore, it is balanced and it follows the rule of thirds. And you have the last image. Please tell me if this picture follows the rule of thirds or not. Okay, obviously, this photograph does not follow the rule of thirds. The subject, which is this beach chair, is located at the center space of your grid lines. If you divide it into nine equal parts, therefore, it is not balanced and it does not follow the rule of thirds.